first of all, uh, thank you very much to the American Bar Association for uh, so kindly uh, providing a venue today. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Mike Meyer and uh, Martha Boschnik from the Darfur Interfaith Network uh, for making this possible and Beth Grossman. I'm also going to ask your indulgence as an audience. I know that there are some Sudan experts here. And please bear with me if I start telling you things you already know, but those lovely people at C-SPAN are here to broadcast this, and therefore I think that it's our duty uh, to use this opportunity to get across the message about uh, the serial genocides that have been going on in Sudan. So forgive me if I'm telling you things uh, that you already know. I know there are people in this room who think that it's perfectly appropriate as a dinner topic conversation to talk about genocide, but believe it or not, not everybody feels the way we do about that. Um, I'm going to first of all talk to you about what's happening in Abia Over the weekend, you probably saw uh, that uh, the Sudanese armed forces occupied uh, the region of Abia. Uh, they brought in 5,000 troops an unknown number of tanks. Uh, they've been uh, basically carpet bombing the city of Abia since the 19th of May. 20,000 people have had to flee for their lives. I've been getting uh, emails from someone we know uh, who works for an agency near Abia all morning, and apparently uh, Sudanese Air Force warplanes are now buzzing the communities of the two neighboring states as well. The message being uh, to terrify the local people. Now, I would like to, first of all, deal with the idea that, <laughs> I mean, when you listen to the diplomats and the politicians from the West, they're sort of expressing surprise that this has happened. Well, they shouldn't because it was completely predictable groups like mine waging peace, the Enough Project, Safe Darfur, the International Crisis Group, Human Rights Watch, we have all been going on and on and on about how Abia was the flashpoint. We've been going on to the point of monotony for months and months because it was always obvious this was going to happen. This was predictable. And the reason it was predictable was that as long as you appease the architects of genocide, and, and in a misguided way, treat them as if they're going to be your partners in peace. As long as you make sure there are no consequences for bad behavior, then the signal that you send to those architects of genocide is that they can carry on. Abia is, in a way, a microcosm of what has been happening throughout Sudan since about 1983. And as with most subjects in Africa, if I'm going to cover this properly, I'm going to go back a few decades to explain what's happening in Abia today, back to the time of the colonial times. Uh, that is so often the story in Africa. Uh, basically, Sudan, uh, until 1956, was part of the British Empire. The British drew a border that put 700 different tribes together. Now, surely this was never going to go terribly well. As, is, as was typical of the colonial power, they chose one group of people, one ethnic group, to do their bidding, uh, to try and control everybody else. That was the people who self-identify as Arabs, who live in Khartoum, Khartoum and along the Nile. And since then, it has been a story of the hegemony of the ethnic groups that define themselves as Arab along the, the Nile against everybody else. It's a story of marginalization. It's also a story of uh, climate change because the Sahara along here is moving south in some places as much as 20 miles a year, in other places three miles a year. This is having an extraordinary domino effect in that a lot of the people, the, the ethnic groups who were living here, mainly self-identifying as Arab, are having to move and they're moving on to land occupied by people who self-identify as black African. Now, you're going to get bored of me saying people self-identify, but here's what I have learned uh, in my time working in 12 different African countries. It does not matter the content of your blood, What matter because there is intermarriage everywhere. What matters is how you self-identify. And part of the story of Sudan is unfortunately the racism of some of the Arab groups who consider themselves to be uh, racially superior 
to the black Africans who live here in the south, this is the size of Texas, and here in Darfur, also about the size of Texas. The difference is these people are Muslim and these people are Christian. The Christians in the south basically, basically objecting to the fact that the people in Khartoum who are Islamist, and I don't mean Islam, I mean Islamist, political Islam, fundamentalist, as practiced by bin Laden and his friends, they wanted to impose Sharia law on the people in the south. And also there was a, there's unfortunately a tremendous amount of racism involved in this. What we've had then since um, independence in 56 was the marginalization of all these other groups around here who feel they have no stake in, the pow in where the power is in Sudan. Uh, the people in Khartoum have actually been rather clever and skillful in the way that they have conducted ethnic cleansing. What they've done is uh, typically there's a pattern to this and it's being repeated to this day right now in Abyei. They use their air force uh, to bomb villages in what they call softening up. And this is then followed not by regular soldiers, but by militias of local um, disgruntled poor Arab nomads whom they pay and arm and they do the dirty work. This has happened since 1983 in South Sudan with the death of 2 million out of 9 million people who live there. And it's happened since 2003 here in Darfur where there's a population of 6 million people, half of whom have now been made homeless. That's 90%. Human Rights Watch reckons 90% of the black African villages of Darfur have been destroyed and emptied and a death of, of 300,000 people, massive displacement. Now, you may wonder what motivates this. And that takes us to something else incredibly topical, of course, and that is Colonel Gaddafi. He's the man who wrote uh, the book some decades ago explaining why all culture in Africa was Arab, that everything else was of no value whatsoever. He's the man who ignited a thousand really ghastly racist thoughts among Arabs. And as you know, today he's busy trying to kill his own population. Uh, the other um, soulmate in all of this program of ethnic cleansing is, of course, uh, Osama bin Laden, who lived in Khartoum for five years. Uh, and I think that, you know, you can define a regime by the friends it keeps. Uh, they also define their, their best friends as Hamas, Hezbollah, and Ahmadinejad of Iran. So you're, you're beginning to get a picture of how they interpret Islam. And I must add that the majority of the world's Muslims totally disagree with their, uh, their uh, adoption of political fundamentalist Islam. But there we are. Recently, two months ago, the president of Sudan, the regime, Arab, based here in Khartoum, was asked to define Islam. And he said this. He said, it is to cut, it is to stone, it is to kill. This is not a vision that the majority of the world's Muslims would embrace. But shockingly, it is one that has been uh, used and is now being used to oppress the black African Christian people of South Sudan and of Darfur. Now, this brings us up to why Abyei is happening. Um, thanks to the incredible work of a lot of American faith groups, and I mean Jews, Christians, Muslims, they shone a light on what was happening in South Sudan. The fact that from 83 onwards, there has been this merciless campaign of ethnic cleansing. And they eventually got uh, the United States government to focus on what was happening there. This is an example of what we can achieve when we actually put our minds to it and when there is international political will. Because of America, uh, the, the people in Khartoum were eventually pressured into having peace talks, going into a, a whole negotiation that dragged on for years, of course. But eventually, in 2005, they signed what's called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which was neither comprehensive nor has it led to peace, but never mind. Uh, and they decided on a notional border around South Sudan. But the problem was this. The people in Khartoum who run the regime uh, it would be wrong to think of them as a, a caricature sort of African dictatorship from central casting. These are very shrewd people. They calibrate exactly the West's lack of interest in Africa. They so 
well know our lack of commitment. And they also understand that we have attention deficit disorder. They